guys, we are so excited to introduce today's guest, Dr. Tracy Dalgleish. Dr. Tracy is a clinical psychologist, couples therapist, author of the incredible new book, I Didn't Sign Up for This, which is part memoir, part self-help, and podcast host of the show, I Am Not Your Shrink. We cannot wait to chat with you today about mental load, resentment, your book, all the things. Thank you so much for coming on Shrink Chicks. Thank you. I'm so excited to have this conversation with both of you. And it's such a needed one too. Ah, it's so wild. It's interesting. We just had this episode came out about hyper independence too. And a few people wrote in, it's like, oh, it's hyper independence has to do with mental load and so much that's related. So let, let's step back for one second before we go into this. I have to know you talk a lot about resentment and mental load. I'm sure lots of people follow you on Instagram. They have to follow you on your amazing Instagram. How did you first start talking about this subject though? Oh my goodness. You know, it actually stemmed from my own experience, truthfully. And that was having my second child. And of course I felt the mental load and the default parents start to show up after having my first, but in 2015, that language wasn't used. And I think that is so important to contextualize this experience is that when I first became a mother, that was, nobody was talking about that and nobody was using the word resentment. So here I am a clinician I know resentment is a normal emotion. I am in my office seeing clients and then I go home and I go, what is this? Why, what, what's going on inside of me? And of course, as therapists do, we think that we shouldn't be struggling with something. We don't talk about it. We have all the skills and tools. We should be getting through it. And it was something that just kept showing up for me. I would, you know, I would just have this frustration and anger and I didn't know what that really was until I started to understand the mental load and until I started to understand what actually resentment symbolizes. So I'll, I'll start there. We, we know that resentment is a really complex emotion and it's a toxic emotion. So if we don't address it, it's going to erode your relationship. And I love reminding people that just because you feel resentment doesn't mean you're headed for the divorce papers. It means we have to listen to it because it's telling you something really important. Mm -hmm. And that's what that was for me is that, okay, something is happening. Something doesn't feel good. And I need to start speaking up to this now. And for many people, we, so we, I like to use the iceberg analogy. So I think it really helps us understand. It's not one thing underneath it. It's multiple things, multiple feelings like unfairness, jealousy, envy. Brene Brown does a fantastic job talking about how envy is underneath resentment anger, anxiety, fear, loss, sadness, all of that is underneath that. And I've come to understand it as two things happening. One is you're not communicating what you need. So you've got this emotion happening and you're not communicating needs. That's one possibility. Or the second one is that your needs are not being met. That doesn't necessarily mean that your partner has to meet your need, but you have got to find a way to meet that need for you. Oh, it's so good. I love the way you just described that. And I think it's so validating for so many people. And, you know, the, the thing that was coming up for me as I was listening to you talk is that, do you think that there are certain times in which we are more susceptible to build that resentment in our relationships? Mm, that's a great question. I'm trying to, what, what comes to mind clinically, so this isn't necessarily from the research, but clinically, it's when something changes and the dynamic of the relationship doesn't adjust to accommodate the change. And of course, we know that we are really good at cementing ourselves in familiar patterns that feel safe, that are known, that oftentimes don't end up helping us. And so then we're not adapting to that change. The classic one in my relationship is the overfunctioning, underfunctioning dynamic. I am an overfunctioner, and naturally, I found myself an underfunctioner <laughs> as well. And that, I mean, that also, there's no blame in what patterns we develop. And I love to remind people, these patterns are there for a really good reason. They were likely adaptive in some way growing up, right? I became the caretaker. It was easy to solve people's problems. I'm an empath. I can feel those things, right? And so here I am excited to be in this partnership with my now husband back then. You know, I'm, I'm at the grocery store. I'm in the deodorant aisle. I'm like, oh, it'd be nice for him to have deodorant at my place. I'll pick him up some deodorant. And then I became the deodorant purchaser. 
And then I became the grocery store purchaser. And then I'm managing the nap schedules with my first and second child. And then he's saying, I can't find the ketchup. Where's the ketchup? And then it's the, does he need to go for a nap? Is it now? Or then, you know, and my husband knows I tell these stories or I have his full permission, but, you know, then he's outside mowing the lawn and I'm rocking the baby. Like where, where did he go? Like it's nap time. I'm managing the nap and he's outside mowing the lawn. And so it, it's these changes that show up in our relationship that we don't often prepare ourselves for, prepare our relationship for. And then we don't know how to accommodate to those changes. Mm. It, well, I had this like really sting memory of uh, when my daughter was born and my husband's going to work, right? And so and when you talk about this idea of envy, I had such envy that it felt like nothing really changed for him. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's still going to, this is before COVID. So there was no, we didn't have any work from home or anything, right? Like it, my husband had no paternity leave. He was back in the office. She was two years old. I was, I mean, two days old. I'm by myself. And he's just going to work and then coming back, telling me about going out to lunch with his friends. Having hot coffee. And, and then you're hot like, coffee. <laughs> I'm like, why am I covered in puke and naked? Like, what is happening? And, right. and, and there was so much anger mm-hmm. that I had that mm-hmm. I did nothing about. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that I just was like, I just shoved that shit all the way down as deep as I possibly could. <laughs> and then why do I want to divorce you two years later? I mean, it, but it's this interesting thing of people's like this fear of if we talk about it, mm-hmm. then we're going to get divorced. Or if we talk about it, then it's going to make it worse. What do you think that's about? Why do you think we're so scared to talk about this? You know, it's so interesting being on the heels of my book, Being Out in the World. So you know that I share the stories of four couples in my book. And the fifth story is my story. And I knew my story had to be in the book because how do I write about the mental load, about resentment, about patterns in our relationships, as if to say, I don't have these same struggles. And I really wanted to show up as human in there. And I think what we're doing as therapists today is we're changing that narrative in the sense that your therapist is this complete blank slate. You know nothing about them. Um, But instead, we're using self-disclosures wisely. We're also opening the door to the general public to say, hey, you know what? Those experts, they're normal. They're human too. And nobody, and, and I think what's behind that is to say, nobody gets away from the pain and struggle we experience in life. Nobody is immune to that. And so, you know, opening up that story within myself, I just lost my train of thought. It's fantastic. Um, but, but to share my own story in there, around resentment around my life changing and his not it it just needed to be told what was your question emily well why do you think we're so scared to talk about yes. it, right this, this okay. fear of like if i talk about that i'm gonna get divorced you mentioned before. right right so so now that the book's out the irony is going to the school drop off and pick up where i know some of the parents follow me but i don't know them close enough for them to be like you're doing amazing things. We loved your story, right? There's this sense of like, oh no, what do they think? They know my story. They know me, right? And and it's this, it's the fear of judgment. It's the fear of embarrassment. It's the fear of rejection that if I go to the playground park and I say, you know, last, last night was just one of those nights. I was so angry with my husband. And there are these moments where it's like, we're so far apart. If we go to the park at that moment, and if someone else meets us there with the like, oh, yeah, then we just have put ourselves in the space of feeling possible rejection or feeling like there's something wrong and defective about us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I know that goes with saying, because I hear the other side of like, well, you, you should protect your marriage. Yes, you should. You should protect the union as long as it's healthy and there's no abuse, right? And there's abuse, you speak out. But but yes, your secrets need to stay with you. You, you, don't, um, you don't put down and vilify and you know make the other person look bad but there is a sense of weeness when we can say to a friend this is really hard this is a really hard season I feel so alone in this and I don't know what to do because as soon as we feel alone in something that's when shame shows up and that's where we get stuck even more And like the, there's such vulnerability in that to be able to show up very authentically in your relationships, to be able to say Mm -hmm. like, yeah, this is really hard. You know, I, I went Mm -hmm. to, um, 
went to a party the other weekend and everyone was like, Hey, like, how's it going? And I decided, you know, instead of just being like, Oh, I'm doing well. How are you? I was like, you know, I'm like not doing so great, you know, (laughs) but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not dumping. I'm not, but I think there is such vulnerability and such, such space to be able to open up vulnerability in those conversations when Mm -hmm. we are really honest about what's going on and understandably. So, you know, in your book and talking about some of those struggles where people are reading it, but, and they might be able to see that for you. Um, but you're not having the one-on-one conversation. That's understandable that that could, could bring up, um, you know, some difficulty in those relationships because it, it ends up being so one-sided in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yet what we know is our healing comes through stories, yeah. telling stories to other, having others witness that vulnerability. And there's also this sense of, I think there's two really important things in here. One is we're not personalizing things, right? If someone tells me something, it's not about me. This Mm -hmm. is about their stuff and what they're going through. And we can practice witnessing that, right? Having that self other space. Um, But then gosh, the other piece of just not being alone in this, we feel, you know, it's so fascinating to be in this time And it makes me think about people who are 20 and who haven't lived without social media, but there's, you know, this, this period right now where we feel more alone than we ever had. And yet we are more connected than we've ever been. That's scary. Yeah, it is. So it's incredibly scary. We just had this conversation. Mm -hmm. We just had uh, an episode of somebody um, talking about like media addiction and how how addicted to phones we are because this gives us this false sense of connection, right? So I look at you and I look at your feed and I think that I'm connected to you or or I post or you comment back and reply to my story or freaking like it or whatever. And um, it's like, oh, we have this relationship. But then at night when things are bad, would you actually reach out to that person? Mm. Would you actually call them? Do we have real, real connection? And it's such a scary thing. And I think it's a really scary thing. I mean, especially as, you know, as moms talk about like, I don't want that for my kid. No, No, I think of what Dr. Vanessa Lapointe said on my podcast is that the uh, internet, social media gives us this short, fast acting dopamine hits but it doesn't give us the soul filling connection that gives us the longer lasting feeling. And it's so true. I could do podcasting all day with people and have these like fill me up conversations. And then when I go home, it's still, although I'm face to face with both of you, it's still that sense of like, I just don't get the feeling of you in front of me. So yeah, yeah, it's a, It's quite challenging. And then also what we're seeing in our partnerships that's contributing to resentment and to the mental load issues is how much are we on our phones? Yes. I mean, how many couples, every couple you work with now brings it up. Mm -hmm. Every couple brings it up at night. I try to get in bed with you and you're on your phone. And then there's one partner says, but that's my time to decompress. And that's what I do to decompress. Like, well, I'm lonely, right? I mean, we hear this story all week long now. And Emily, I remember, I, I I remember the moment the iPad came into our bed. My husband got it as he <laughs> won it at like a golf tournament, like, which is so cool, right? Oh, it's amazing. You won the iPad. And then it's like side eye in bed. And, right. you know, and then he's falling asleep with his like heavy iPad, but like yes. flopping all over it's the like bed. like the third, third person <laughs> in the, the bed. It's the mistress. Yeah. You guys totally, are cuddle, right. cuddling the iPad. But it's the mistress in the bed, right? It's like this thing of like, wait, why am I fighting with this other thing? And the disconnection is Mm -hmm. just so bad, right? And disconnection is going to lead towards resentment, towards anger, towards all these things we're talking about. Um, We have a lot of listener questions for you. Are you ready for them? I love listener questions. Okay, Okay. great. All right. Um, uh, what are your thoughts? We, so we talked about this a little bit before. What are your thoughts about hyper-independence and carrying the mental load? Do you think they're related? Uh, yes, I think they're related. Um, so hyper-independence goes into that sense of, I've got this, I can do this on my own, I do it better. Um, if I lean on you, you're not going to be there for me anyways, right? So if we have these narratives and the stories we tell ourselves, 
then we are going to be more likely to keep all of this stuff on us. Mm -hmm. Listen, it takes a lot of risk to say to your partner, this isn't working for me anymore. Or to even say, we need to find a standard. You know, Eve Rotsky does a great job talking about the minimum standard of care. That definition for me, working with couples in the therapy room has been huge to have. And also in my own marriage, like what's our minimum standard of care? It's not going to work to send our kids on pink shirt day in the wrong colored shirt because they're going to feel excluded. So if you are on school duty, that's Greg, my husband's, that's his stuff. You got to do pink shirt day too, right? And so you talk about minimum standard of care, but if you can't lean on the other person and believe that they're there with you doing it, then you're going to continue to hold on to the mental load. Mm -hmm. And that also will build more resentment. And so we've got to kind of find this balance of, well, and you both know this, right? Independent. Oh, I have to tell you this. 22, 21 year old Tracy enters into her thesis supervisor's office. She's finishing her undergrad. He is this like six, three, 65 year old man, white hair. Like every time I go in there, he's giving me a new research paper here, attachment here, couples, relationships, attachment, attachment. And I come in, I say, I've got it. I have it. I'm, I'm secure. I'm independent. Right. I'm like, 21 I've evolved. And he's like, (laughs) Tracy, independence is fine. Interdependence is better. I remember leaving being like, okay, sure. (laughs) So now I have to go find a partner. Um, But you know, it's just that piece around, yeah, I get it. Society teaches women, especially be independent, you know, do the thing, rely on yourself. You don't need anybody. And while on one hand, that's important to be autonomous. On the other hand, we have to lean on the other person. It's not possible to hold all of this on Mm -hmm. your own. Oh, yeah. We had had someone ask, oh, are you going to go? I wanted the tit for tat mentality. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Oh, the tit for tat mentality. Um, In what sense? Like, is that that part of the hyper-independence? How to switch out of the tit for tat mentality. So hard to appreciate anything my partner does because I do so much more. Mm. Keep it score, baby. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) fairness, I grew up in a family of fairness and I know fairness very well. And also as children, we learn fairness very early on. It's so fascinating to watch my children grow and evolve. Um, And the first thing that happens is, well, that's not fair. Why, Why does she get to have three jelly beans and I only get two it's like well if you would like to have another one go ahead you can ask for another one right like we're very much doing this like when you have a why does she and you're pointing outwards you got to point that back inwards to ask yourself what do I need so if mm-hmm. you're keeping score then that likely means you haven't balanced enough or that you need to reassess what your needs are there's something else that you're needing um but listen you don't go for equal in your relationship. You have to go for what feels fair. It's never going to be 50-50. That's just the way it is. But when someone says that, that to me says you're holding too much of the mental load and you need to offload a bit more. You need to renegotiate around some of those tasks. Yes. And maybe some, read Fair Play. <laughs> yeah. I'll, and and read Fair Play. Or better yet, if you're in a head of relationship with your man or get your other partner, to read the book first. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yep. So, I mean, it, it perfectly uh, transitions into our next question. How would you describe or explain the mental load to your partner? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Zach Watson. He was on my podcast. He's fantastic providing a male perspective, a heterosexual male perspective on the mental load. And then my husband and I have had many of these conversations as well. Okay. How do we explain it? So it's not, and then I think of how Eve Roski explains it too, because it's not just like who thinks they go get the groceries. It's like, how do you know what type of mustard needs to be in the fridge? She's Mm -hmm. fantastic at describing that story. Um, The mental load is not just about understanding the task to complete it, but the mental load is about understanding all of the cognitive labor, all of the thoughts, all of the planning that goes into the actual execution of the task. And again, I think that's very much a fair play, Eve Rotsky type definition for what the mental load is. Um, and then and defining it as the cognitive labor that is either visible and invisible in the home. And so I, I just, I remember one time trying to describe it to my husband. This is a journey for us as well, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, it wasn't there when we first 
um, got married or had our first child, um, I remember saying something like, well, I'm the one thinking about our niece's birthdays and planning to get their gifts. And his reply was like, well, no, I, I go and pick up the gifts too. I'm like, right. But do you know what size she is? Do you know her favorite color? Do you know that last year we got her that Lego set? So this year it's not going to be that Lego set. And have you planned it ahead of time in order to send it out? Cause she's on the West coast in time. So she gets it and you've given the card. So that to me is what makes up the mental load. Mm-hmm. Ooh, in my uh, marriage, it is a uh, cleaning out um, the clothes for the next season. Mm. I said to my husband, I'm like, you've never once cleaned out mm, the clothes. Right. Right. And so what do you think he would say in a typical male fashion? Well, I, if it doesn't fit, I don't put it on her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes, yeah, yeah. but so the, <clears throat> I'm like, yeah, but then I used to dig through all the clothes and then it's a mess because you're finding the right sizes. We got to uh-huh. do this. And yeah. so then this amazing thing happens um, right uh, in 2020, which is my husband um, and rage quit his job, um, which was frankly a long time coming. But we basically were like, listen, quit it. This isn't working for us anymore as a family. We will be fine without it, whatever. So my husband has this day where he is trying to cook something and he can't find anything in the spices cabinet. Now, when we moved into our house, I was uh, eight months pregnant and I basically just shoved everything away. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is something we're going to deal with later. <laughs> this is not a now problem. Um, <clears throat> and he's looking for something to cook and he can't find it. And I came home and he said, I get it now. Ooh. I couldn't find a single thing. It was so frustrating. I had to take every single thing out of the cabinets. Um, and now I get it. Now I understand why the organization matters. Yeah. And then if two weeks later, he stood up at the Thanksgiving uh, dinner and he said to my uh, sister-in-law, who's a stay-at-home mom, I just want to say that I would never do this again. And God bless you. <laughs> And he quickly went back to work, but um... (laughs) Uh, uh, yeah. So, okay. So that also is part of the problem around the mental load is that oftentimes when we try to renegotiate tasks, we give off the execution of something. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because in our marriage, we've had both roles. So I have been the one where I grocery, I meal planned, I grocery shopped. I knew where everything was. I knew how much of what we had left. And then I would meal plan. Maybe sometimes my husband would make the meal as well. Um, So we'd trade off making meals. And then we had a big switch in our, in our dynamic, he's at home and I was trying to do the grocery shopping while he was trying to make the meals. And that just didn't work. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't know what, what's in the fridge. Yeah. I don't, are we out of broccoli? How many heads do we have left? And you know, yogurt, what's the level of yogurt? So that didn't work. So I gave it all to him. And so he's got the grocery shopping and meal making. Sometimes, you know, food ruts happen. So we pitch in around making, deciding what we're going to make that week and make a plan if we're like on our game, that doesn't happen all the time. Mm-hmm. So, so then the other thing we're starting to do is once a week, I will make a dinner, but it is the most frustrating experience. And I, I share this because I, I imagine many of your listeners are women. Yes? yes. I share this from my female perspective, because I know sometimes we get frustrated at our partners for not finding the things, but I'm in that role now. I find myself getting frustrated when I'm making a meal. Like, where is this? I thought we had this. Why don't we have this? And like, so I get frustrated because that's not my task anymore, like task. Mm. So it really is interesting when we start playing with the conceptualization, planning and execution of tasks and seeing that, you know, there are a lot of pieces that go into each task. And, and oftentimes, you know, I always like to remind people of this. It, it's not malicious. It's not that Mm-mm. they don't necessarily want to. It's that we, for women especially, have been conditioned to do all of this. Yes. Well, and one of the things we say in our marriage is blame the system, not the person. Yes. We just haven't figured out the right system. You have to, or you have to rejig your system. Yep. Yes. And mm-hmm. so we have to keep working and that's about working together as a team. It And it also makes me think about, you know, when you do carry on these very specific tasks, there's also something about it that allows you to be like very invested in those things and like have more control. We were having this conversation earlier that, but when you don't have that task and you're so separated from it, right? It's, it's harder to kind of know where the spices are or, Mm -hmm. and so there is this level of like being very connected to things when you are taking all of those things on, feel like you have a little bit more control over them. Mm -hmm. Um, that I think also is at the same time, hard to give up. Yeah. I I know people really struggle to hand things over and to give, give things up. And and that does take, and I want, I want to remind people that when you do that, we have to 
check ourselves of how we're showing up. It's not going to be done the same way, nor does it need to be. It doesn't need to be done the same way as long as something is done. And then also to remembering that we always have choices afterwards. So if you don't do, if your partner doesn't, so that let's, we talk, I talked about lunches once on, on Instagram and people had a really hard time with stepping back from making the kids lunch. Well, what if the kids lunch isn't made in the morning? What if he wakes up and he's grumpy and upset? And it's like, yeah, and he still has to make the lunch if that's his task. Because what we do is we come in and we rescue. And every time we come in and we rescue our partner, they do not learn. I, I, I've shared this before, and I know the wording has kind of hit some people where I've said, let your partner fail. This doesn't mean I'm, you know, sitting in the corner on my phone being like, <laughs> he's <laughs> failing, right? <laughs> Finally, you know what it's like. Like that, that's not, it's not supposed to be malicious. It's the, you know, see if he can do the task and then problem solve after. Have empathy for your partner. Yeah, I know. I get it. Making lunches is so hard. The kids are complaining again that you made ham sandwiches. I 100% get that. Is there something that I can do to support you? Or what system do you need to put in place? Right? Again, this is not you taking everything back on because they can't do it. You have to allow them to learn up to where you are. And that takes practice. Uh, Harriet Lerner uses the expression hanging in, which I absolutely love, right? Change does not happen overnight. You got to hang in. Okay. So here's another good one. You ready for it? I love these questions. Yeah. They're really, people are amazing. I'm obsessed with listener questions. Okay. Why do I feel guilty around asking to share the mental load? Oh, that's two. There's two in there. So one is I'd be curious what your partner's response is. So if they are upset about it, you're taking on their feelings and that's leading you to feel guilty. It's not actually that you're doing anything bad. Let's just be clear about that. Talking to your partner about this, this is a we problem. You and I have already, like we've said, this is a system. You are working in a system together. So if they're upset about it, that is you practicing validation, separation, depersonalizing it, like giving it back to them, right? You've got your glass wall up. You can see them empathize. So I think that would be one piece. I think the other piece is really deep in our conditioning around what it means to be a woman and how much we are taught to be small, to not ask for what we need, don't inconvenience other people, be the caregiver, be the good girl. And that really, I think, triggers this guilt that when we are asking for something to change, um, it doesn't feel good. It's hard. Yeah. 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 And then I also like to ask people, what did you see growing up? Who who played what role? And what's it like for you to be different? And also ask yourself, what do I want to take forward? You don't have to do the same thing your parents did just because, and, and of course, too, then also too, when you know, you have the older generation saying, are you looking after him? Are you feeding him enough? Right. And it's like, that's not my job. That's his job. Um, I, I gotta tell this story. Yeah. So, uh, I love stories. so Jen and I recently moved office spaces. We have a great company called the therapy group yes. with about 45 clinicians, best people in the fucking world. Okay. So we moved this, we have been spending the past seven months redoing this building. It was this massive undertaking and we finally, finally come to the day that the movers are coming. We're doing the move <laughs> by uh, chance. The, the three humans, that the four humans that showed up to do this move were the four most unhappy humans I've met in my entire life to be doing this move. Um, they were pissed to be there. They, you would have thought that we duped these people and tricked them into this move, although it was- Come for cupcakes. Big. Oh, we're that's, moving. Yes, that's yeah. what, that is what, not that we like paid a professional moving company. Like you would have thought we duped these people. They were, you know, very pissed that we had an upstairs to our new building, even though it like said on the thing. And so we noticed this thing. So it's the four- male movers and then me jen our amazing head of operations nikki and then our amazing um another amazing staff member kate and we noticed this really interesting thing started happening which is the angrier they got the more we started trying to take care of them oh. i'm offering them water i'm offering them snacks all of a sudden we're walking now we moved 500 we moved down the street 500 feet across yeah. the street yeah. we're walking over we're moving stuff and so finally, we were all like, I was like, we got to like take a break here. And we started this conversation. We're like, oh, we're all taking, we're all so uncomfortable with how Ooh. upset they are right now. We're taking care of them. Uh, on, on a, it, it, yeah, I'm like, where are my words? It, it, in the sense that they are supposed to be taking care of you by yes. moving these things, but the yes. dynamic that showed up. But and it was were so, so automatic. It oh, just so automatic. It was so yeah. automatic. And I think, you know, a part of us and this, I, 
you know, I think a lot of women in their relationships feel this too. Like this just has to get done, right? Mm -hmm. It has to get done. And so I'm just going to do it. And I think that that so easily throws your relationships in, in this situation into an overfunction or underfunctioner piece. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was a lot of what was coming up for us was, well, this just has to happen, right? Like they can keep complaining, but like this has to get done. And so I also, instead of having the conversation with them of, Hey, like, I know this is hard, but like, we need to make sure that we get these things done or we need, instead of just having this open up a conversation with them, we started over functioning. We started mm. just picking up that role. Yeah. Um, and, and it, I, I think it's, it's so automatic to just take it on yourself, yeah. um, instead of feeling like you have space to speak up and say like, Hey, you know, we hired you for this, you know, in our minds, we were like, Oh, we hired them. Like this is going to be an easy day. Like we won't have to do much. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm so confused though, in terms of like the terms of contract, like you, you're moving. Yeah. yeah this, was you a up this, this was a weird situation in it general. Was, um, okay. you know, <laughs> This is this is a normal situation, but the interesting thing that came like, from it. I didn't was... sign up for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, you're like this. You're exactly. like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> Am I paying myself now? Like, what are we paying for? Because I'm moving across oh the street. Word. We're, we're right. hauling desks up. But it was so interesting that all these levels started happening, which is one, we were uncomfortable with their big feelings. Two, oh. we were um, like, this just has to get done. We just have to do it. We go into hyperdrive. And then three, um, which is we avoided the conversation with them. Right. That, that, so that's the other piece. This is what I see commonly in relationships is when, especially when I'm working with an individual and I'll say, so how did that conversation go? Did you talk about it with them? Uh, yeah, I brought it up. Okay. Tell me more. Well, you know, I kind of, right. It was like a door handle conversation. She's at the door telling him something, right. Or it's the like, yeah, I tried to have a conversation and he got mad. And so it's this idea that that one conversation marks the entire thing and I'm not going to go back and talk about it and I'm not going to bring it up again and I'm not right and, and it's this this reminder that when it comes to expressing our needs when it comes to creating change in our relationships this is not a one-time conversation mm -hmm. you didn't get here by just one one move or one step it is the let's sit down again let's tweak let's revisit how's our system going how's our system in our relationship going and we really discredit or discount rather how a relationship operates, which is the most important team that you're running. And te a team needs you to sit down and check in with each other, talk about how things are going, what's working, what's not. I love, I love how you're kind of expressing that, that this is a process that happens over time and you work together to figure it out and you work together uh -huh. to communicate about it. Cause I think it's true is when you're someone who's so used to taking things on yourself, right. Uh -huh. And uh, maybe you have that hyper independence, maybe you're used to that. And when you reach out for help or you reach out to say, here are my needs and that person doesn't respond in a holding way that it's so easy to retreat back into yourself and say, well, I never should have asked. See, like I, right. I was right. I never should have asked. Right. Um, but because it's, it's such a brave experience to do something that is so, so uncomfortable for you, but is for the better of the relationship and then the better of your mental health too. So, um, so yeah, just the idea that it is a process and to not turn back into yourself and say, well, I tried, I can never do that again, because I can imagine the amount of resentment that continue, continues to build off of that. To not turn into yourself or to not turn on them. Mm -hmm. I love stories. So I have another story. Yes. And the, the thing I have accepted about the mental load and about being in partnership with my partner is that that we're, we're going to do these things for the next how many years? And it's about just kind of like, okay, there's a little bit of tension. We work through it. It's normal and healthy. We are on the same page. We know we're, we're in a season together. We've got young kids. There's a lot of demands. Our basement flooded this summer. We're just lots of busy things, right? So, so anytime we find these like new, I call them like growth edges, it has to be met with compassion, understanding with empathy. We were at a face wash and I had been opening, you know, as I do, I open the lid and then I'm like scraping from the bottom, washing my face in the shower. I noticed the other one that I think he was using is empty. So I'm like, okay, 
I left it there. Okay. I, no, I wasn't trying to be passive aggressive, but I left that one there. So I'm still scraping at the bottom. And obviously we're both in the shower every single day and neither one of us has bought face wash. Now it's not really any of our tasks. So then the next one day I go into the shower and I'm thrilled to see that he has bought face wash. So I go over to look at it and it says men's face wash. So I was like, it's interesting. Okay. So I expressed to him, I was like, oh, I know she bought face wash. Like, oh, I know it was an impulse buy. It was a little bit of an expensive one. Eh? I'm like, actually, that's not what I noticed. I noticed that you bought men's face wash. And I went to him being very much like, okay, I want to talk about this. Cause I think this is a really curious experience for us right now of what happened. And he's like, yeah, I bought the face wash. Oh, it was impulse last minute. I said, yeah, but what's interesting is you really held you in mind and your context, but you didn't do the we. So it was great that you bought yourself face wash, but where's mine? And so you knew we were empty, but you didn't hold the relational, the self other, the whole picture in here of like, hmm, where's my partner right now? What context are they living in? What's going on in their world? Mm -hmm. And it was just really interesting to see that I know women are trained relationally. Like we're taught to be relational, look outward, look to others, care for people, bring them in, gather, nurture, right? And then men often are taught in the individualistic, right? Look after the self. And there's nothing wrong that we, we did. We showed up with these conditioned parts of us, but we were then able to say, look at how we could do this differently next time. Okay, wait. So I have a final question. Somebody wrote in about a, a recent Instagram post that you had. Oh, uh, they said that, um, can you tell us more about the idea you posted about, which is the things that once attracted you to your partner might oh. be the biggest sorts of resentment today? This is so, such an interesting experience. I remember learning this actually in my PhD and I'll never forget my supervisor sharing this and then just how I can witness it in couples ever since. I always start out by saying what attracted you to each other. And let's say he says, oh, she you know, made decisions so easily. She was a natural leader. I just love that about her. And then what attracted you to him? He was so easygoing. I loved how we could get together and connect. Okay. And then we, you know, flow through my questions in the interview and we get to what's the problem today. She's so bossy. She's always telling me what to do. And then she will say, he never makes a decision. It's always on me. I always... It happens so, all the time. Absolutely. Right. Right. So maybe we could talk about this on a lot of different levels, but we, we do seek partners that uh, actually I'll, I'll share this as well. Um, I was working through um, one of uh, an issue with a client and how her partner was always so out there and doing lots of things and, you know, and that was stirring up resentment for her. And again, we were tapping into envy for her because she had shut this part down of her. When she got into a relationship with him, she made herself small and she stopped being that person. And so that was a really interesting discovery too. So we, we have reactions to things that are mirrors for us that are reflecting something back. So, you know, I do believe that we choose partners that maybe they have something that we're missing and maybe we resent them because they have it and we don't, we get angry at it because they have it. We don't, or because that part of them has then bumped up against something within us that we struggle with. So why don't you make more decisions, right? Like if you just made more decisions, we wouldn't have this issue, but you chose someone who actually never made those decisions mm -hmm. before. Ooh, what do you think? What, what, what do both of you think about that? No, it's so true. My, my partner had this thing. So one of the things I thought was super hot about him right in college and he would like do not work all week long, like just party and have fun. And then like the week before something was due, he'd stay up like all night doing it and still get an A. Like my husband's incredibly intelligent. And I was like, oh, that's so cool, right? Like we can like have all this fun. And now as an adult, he'll stay up until three in the morning working on a project. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a kid in my bed by five and I'm like, this actually sucks. This thing I thought was super yeah. cool and awesome <laughs> doesn't really work when you have a child, but in college it was great. <laughs> does he do Christmas or holiday shopping right before? Like, does he leave the last minute? Everything, everything. <laughs> this is who we are where I'm like, let me get that done three months early. But in college, I was such a control freak. I thought it was so cool. Cause he was so different yeah. than me. Right. He but felt look, so he much more reflected free. that back to you. Something that you yeah. didn't have. 
And yep. now because of that control part of you that works for you, right? It gets you to do all these totally. cool things, right? But then he can just like go sit on the couch and not think about what's going <laughs> to happen tomorrow. And you're like, I wish I could sit on the couch and not think yes. about what's going to happen tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. And I'm I'm very much the opposite in my relationship. <laughs> like when my when I first started dating my husband, he would be like, okay, like, let's go here and uh, I'll meet you at like seven o'clock. I was like, cool. I don't have to make a decision. Like, this is wonderful. Mm. And now he very much is thinking about things. I honestly think he's the one that carries the mental load in our yeah, relationship. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he um, does. Like he's the one who like before bed is rattling off all of the anxieties and things we have to remember. So he very much carries the mental load in our relationship. Um but yeah, now, I, and I would say I take more of a laid back role. And um, so, yeah, but those things, but there's also a part of me that can really appreciate that in him, that he does remember all of those things and he takes care of all of those things um, and, you know, can hold me to a different standard because there also is something that I really envy in someone who can make decisions that quickly. Right. Who is able. Right. And so this is why my relationship with Emily works <laughs> so well is because we really balance each other out in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. And so there is a beautiful balance that I think that you can achieve, um, you know, as long as you're able to communicate through it and in order yeah. to, and you have to be able to have these conversations in mm -hmm. order to get to that point. And I think that that's, you know, in these dynamics, sometimes where we fall short is really talking through a lot of these things. Yeah. And building our perceptions and assumptions about the other person, right? Yes. We hold that so tightly that we think we know what's going to happen or we assume why they've done something or why they said something. Our minds are so powerful and they really trip us up when it comes yeah. to connection and working through hard conversations. Absolutely. So Dr. Tracy, as you know, on the show, with every guest we have, we play a segment called Calling Bullshit. And we ask you to call some type of BS in your field, your topic of choice, whatever you want. What is the bullshit you want to call today? The expression, don't go to bed angry. <laughs> yes. I see that one showing up. I'm trying to educate. Oh, I see you know that one showing up. Oh my goodness. Um, it's probably 1 million years ago. Yeah, yeah it, it's actually, I think it's biblical. It's actually um, oh, I'm right. yeah, it more sense. based in, <laughs> in religion. Um and, you know, I want to t challenge people that I get it. And, you know, that has been, I think it was even said at our wedding as well. You know, someone passes that down all the time. And what I think is so important to rephrase that too, is it's not that you need to resolve everything. Because here's the thing, when your emotions are high, when you're dysregulated, you can't make sense of things. One person's flooded. The other one's trying to be heard and understood. And oftentimes you're fighting to be right, right? Let's just resolve this. See it my way. No, see it my way. It's at that point where you shift out of the problem. You put it in a box, you put it on your shelf, or, you know, you put it in the kitchen counter and you say, we know we'll come back to this. Let's connect. Let's give each other a hug because we love each other and we're in this together. And that is what you do going to bed not about resolving this, right? So um, the emotion of anger is not a bad thing, but it's that we want to focus on feeling connected in some way and then moving forward. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Love that. Yeah. We love that. We debunk love that it. all the time. Yeah. It's such a good one and so important for people to so remember. Important. Yeah. I, I saw like, a, you know, like those like uh, home good signs, right? I saw one that said, don't go to, or, always kiss me good night and don't go to bed angry. And I was mm. like, oh, I turned it backwards in the store. <laughs> yeah, good job. That was my passive aggressive. Good job. Oh, good job. Em. You got home goods. <laughs> I, sh I showed them, You really showed I? home yeah. goods. Yes. But I <laughs> also do, like, you know, honoring that if, I, if I'm having such hard feelings tonight that I can't give you a kiss, I want you to know we're in this together. I love you. I know we'll get through this. I'm going to honor where I am right now, but for us to trust that this doesn't mean we're making or breaking anything. It yes. just means that like, you know, stuff is hard. I yes. need to sleep and sleep helps everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Truly. I'm going to, I'm going to find that sign and I'm going to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. I love, um, uh, Dr. Tracy, we can't thank you enough for being here today. 
where can people um buy i didn't sign up for this where can they listen to i'm not your shrink where can they find you Mm -hmm. yes so the best place i'm on instagram send me a dm please let me know what stood out for you from today i love having those dms come to me so please do that um you can and that's dr tracy d website is drtracyd.com and all of the links and details are there. And then all the links to my podcast are there as well. So that's the best place. But I have lots of free resources that you can check out. And then my book, I didn't sign up for this. Grab it. You'll enjoy the stories of how couples built interdependence. It's incredible. We were lucky to get to read as well. You have to purchase this book. We can't thank you enough for listening to today's episode. We always ask you to rate, review, subscribe, follow an Apple podcast, listen wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us at Shrink Chicks or The Therapy Group. If you're looking to connect with a clinician, we would love to hook you up with that. Check us out, thetherapygroup.com. And don't forget to grow yourself. You got to know yourself. We'll see you next time.